representatives. In the city, we pay our taxes, but we are not represented. Taxation without representation is tyranny. We are tired of tyranny. We are tired of tyranny. We are somebody. Respect us. The Reverend Jesse Jackson, the son of an Alabama sharecropper, was baptized in the civil rights struggle when he served as the, quote, point man, end quote, at a number of the Greensboro sit-ins. In 1963, Reverend Jackson joined the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and quickly gained a reputation for his organizing ability by rallying Chicago's black clergymen behind the then president of SCLC, the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. Reverend Jackson became a close friend and advisor to Dr. King and for several years headed up the economic arm of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference known as Operation Breadbasket. In 1971, Reverend Jackson formed Operation Push, People United to Save Humanity, and has served as president of that national organization since that time. convention in Charleston in July. What would you say are some of the major accomplishments of Operation PUSH? Uh, the most major one is that the president is from Greenville, South Carolina. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> He's not the son well, of an Alabama. We're going <laughs> to we gonna have to go back to Ebony, Albany. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> you know, I'm proud of the people from Greenville, <laughs> Ebony, South Carolina. But perhaps the most major focus that we've had across the years is one on economic development and political empowerment. The convention in Charleston, July 13th through the 17th, will have a major focus on extending and protecting the political franchise of black people. In a real sense, even though we got the right to vote again in 1965, new forms of denial are now employed to deny blacks political representation. Prior to 1965, poll tax and literacy tests were used to deny blacks, poor whites, and Hispanics the right to vote. But since 1965, they now use new forms of denial. One, the registrars by and large are not monitored, and they arbitrarily determine when the books can be opened. Thus, in some instances, they will not come to churches where people are in mass, or they will not come to schools where people are in mass. And they will not open the books at convenient registration hours. There's a lot of arbitrariness in the voter registrar conduct. That is a factor. The second factor is that they now use uh, annexation. When blacks are about to become the majority, in many instances, they simply move the fence back and make it more difficult to get elected. Or they use gerrymandering. They draw lines in such a way it becomes difficult to get elected. Or as in Columbia, they use at-large elections. The same people who will not let us live at large in open housing or go to school at large or marry at large or go to church at large want us to vote at large. It's a, school, it's a scheme of destruction through dilution. And so we have these new impediments to fight. One focus of our convention will be to invite, and he has already accepted, the head of the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, William Bradford Reynolds, will address our convention and we will give him testimony and depositions from these counters of extreme low voter registration in South Carolina. In many ways, the Voting Rights Act in South Carolina has been reduced to an Indian treaty, an unenforced law. 48% of the blacks in this state are unregistered. and All of it cannot be pointed to apathy. Sometimes it's tyranny and intimidation. Sometimes it's voter registrars being arbitrary other times, it's the Justice Department itself not being dutiful. The result is, even though one-third of all eligible voters in this state are black, 302,000 are registered, 292,000 or 48% are unregistered. The result is, uh, there's no black congressman from South Carolina. We're one-third. We should have at least two. There's no black in the state senate in South Carolina. Or uh, there's no black in the municipal government in, in Columbia, South Carolina. So we must take a hard look at political empowerment in this state, our goal is to register 100,000 additional black voters in this state this year. We know it will have a tremendous impact upon the politics of the state and upon the plight and destiny of poor people. The flip side of our agenda, beside naming the 10 counties that we will focus in in this state, 
We will name the, the coordinators, the ministers, the elected officials, and others who will be a part of this team that will be trained during this convention is the economic side. We trade with corporate America. Corporate America does not trade with us. By and large, these corporations have been the real reason why our nation is in such economic trouble. Mayors didn't pull out of, out of major cities, corporations did. Mayors did not replace uh, people with machines, corporations did. Mayors and governors did not go abroad to get slave labor or uh, slave voters. Corporations went abroad to get slave labor market, to undercut the American labor market. And so we must look at corporations in a very new and different kind of way. We're going to name 10 corporations in this state. They get more than their margin of profit from black consumers and black workers, and we're going to visit them with a combination of lawyers and ministers and researchers. We expect to demand of them a trade agreement. If they will trade with us, retain black lawyers, retain black CPAs, use our advertising agencies, use our models, use our banks, give our children our share of scholarships, if they will trade with us, we will trade with them. We want to be their trading partners, but if they will not trade with us, we will not trade with them and thus become civil warriors. And thus the real focus of this convention, the July 13th through the 17th, will be political empowerment and economic development. Let me get back to my initial question. What would you say are some of the major accomplishments of Operation PUSH? One would have to say that PUSH's role in getting the Voting Rights Act extended has been a major political contribution. Or one could talk about the time that we unseated the Daily Delegation in, in Miami, Florida in 1972, a number of other elections we've been involved in. But our voting rights uh, have been severely threatened by the Reagan administration and by Strom Thurmond's behavior, conduct, and attitude toward the extension of the Voting Rights Act. Tomorrow, I'll be in Washington, D.C. at the White House, where President Reagan will sign into law for the next 25 years the extension of the Voting Rights Act with Section 2 and Section 5, the enforcement provisions built into that piece of legislation. So extending the Voting Rights Act, in which we played a major part along with SCLC, NAA, and other organizations, has been a major contribution. The other part, of course, is economically. Last year, we determined to go after the private economy in a very different kind of way. If Reagan cuts public aid and corporations deny private trade, we have nothing left but Kool-Aid, but sign not in it, or a formula for death. We said to Coca-Cola, we are more than 25% of your company. We provide that margin of your business. And so we won't trade with you. At that point, Coca-Cola had 550 bottlers, zero black. They had 4,000 fountain wholesalers, zero black. They had a $160 million advertising budget, budget less than a half million dollar black. We simply want our share. We have the money to invest. We have the skill. We're willing to work hard. We simply want a fair return on our investment. They finally did not see our way. And they decided not to sign a trade agreement. We withdrew from them for three weeks. We renegotiated the contract. The result is there are now 20 black fountain wholesalers of that company. Now black banks are getting letters of credit. Now for the first time, there's a black senior vice president. Now former ambassador Donald McHenry is on the board. The follow-up to that has been a $360 million five-year trade agreement with the Hublin Corporation. For the first time, blacks will own 114 Kentucky Fried franchises. For the first time, blacks will have $75 million in business in procurement contracts with that company. Again, we have the money, we have the skill and the will. We simply must break up restraint of trade. So I would say that the Hublin and Coca-Cola agreements, now we're about to sign a deal fairly soon with 7-Up with or uh, with Budweiser. We're focusing now on the auto industry as well as the beverage industry. So again, political empowerment and economic development, apart from just surviving as an organization, have been real hallmarks for Operation PUSH. Okay, this is for the people, and we're talking with the president of Operation PUSH, the Reverend Jesse Jackson. From South Carolina. From South Carolina. Not a sharecropper's child from <laughs> Alabama. We'll have to talk to Ebony <laughs> about that. Okay, we'll take that. What does the American business community think about your approach? 
Well, at first, they have grown so accustomed to one-way trade and monopoly trade, they are offended when we ask of them reciprocal trade or two-way trade. They expect reciprocal trade when they deal with Japan or any other nation because they want balance of trade. Indeed, they want trade surplus. Many of them have grown so accustomed to exploiting blacks that they have no real appreciation of the significance of opening up trade options for black America. The fact of the matter is once they engage in the trade agreement, they find it to be mutually beneficial. If white America holds black America in the ditch, we can't grow and white America can't grow. It's only when they get off of our back can they express themselves and grow and we can grow. Suppose white America had disallowed Jesse Owens from participating in the 1936 Olympics. America could not have won. So to hold Jesse Owens down would have been to hold the nation down. Or Max Smelling and Joe Lewis. If Joe Lewis had not been able to fight, the Germans would have had the world champion. So to hold us down would have been to hold the nation down. Or to disallow uh, Marin Anderson from performing in the arts would be to limit America's art. Or did we not rise in spite of the holding back? Well, indeed we did. We, we had to be superior to be equal. But the point is that these various, various forms of restraint of trade held the nation back. There is a divine law of reciprocity. You really cannot help somebody without helping yourself. You really cannot hurt somebody without, without hurting yourself. That which goes around indeed does come around. So in 1947, when Jackie Robinson was able to play baseball, for him it meant a chance to grow. But for the baseball league, it meant a chance to expand. You could not have the expanded major leagues without black players participating. The same as in football, basketball, and baseball. Politically, Jimmy Carter could not have gotten to the White House if he had been the governor of a state where blacks could not vote. So by holding us back, it would have held him back. Well, now, corporate America, black America, has more money than all the nations in the world except nine. Black Americans pay $30 million a month in union dues. Black Americans uh, spend $145 billion a year with corporate America. Black Americans buy more from corporate America than Russia and China and Japan combined. So in a real sense, to ignore black wealth, to ignore black trade, to ignore black skill, is a luxury that America can ill afford. I suggest to you that in part we're in trouble in the economic order because of unused black talent, black money, and black ideas, thus a decline in productivity. It would be like you not allowing 12% of your body to function because you didn't like it, because you didn't understand it. And so in a real sense, America operates against American interests by engaging in restraint of trade and development against black Americans. Let us pause a minute to invite the viewing audience in South Carolina <laughs> to call and ask questions or make comments. If you're in Columbia, the number is 758-5248. If you're in Columbia, the number is 758-5248. If you're outside Columbia, the toll-free number is 1-800-922-1560. Outside Columbia, the toll-free number is 1-800-922-1560. 1560. That's up in Greenville, South Carolina, Alabama, where my mother is <laughs> watching this program. <laughs> <laughs> what, I know you've heard it, what do you say to those white business people who say that this is blackmail? Well, they must first define blackmail or, or illicit solicitation. Uh, and that is that if I want to take something from a business person because I have something over his head that may embarrass him and therefore force him to give me money to keep from divulging uh, something about the person that's embarrassing that's called blackmail which is wrongly put or it's called illicit solicitation well that's not what we're doing we are very public we are seeking reciprocal trade we say to the corporation if you want us to trade with you, you trade with us. That's fair. If you don't want us to trade with you, then don't trade with us, or vice versa. So we're talking about a mutually beneficial economic arrangement. And those who simply have such venom and such hatred and such blindness until they will deny us trade 
and expect us not to expect trade, they are really expecting too much. Okay, all lines are lit. Let's take a call. For the people, you're on the air. Yes, I'd like to ask Reverend Jackson, what ingredient does he think uh, the black people in this country need to be totally successful as far as uh, economically and family-wise and, and totally? What, what is the main ingredient? Is <laughs> destruction of, of the family uh, unit within the black communities, is that, is that something that has a, a, a major effect on the, on the uh, continuing success or, or trying to be successful? Okay, thank you. I think there are really four angles. One angle, of course, is the, is the historical angle. That is that black Americans came to this country not as immigrants or refugees. We came as slaves. And that is definitely a different track for those who came on slave ships and those who came on the immigrant ships. Not only did we come in ways that were against our interests and against our will, but since we've been here, blacks are in a color cast. If you looked out right now and saw 40 or 50 white people, some may be Lithuanian, some may be German, or Irish, or Italian, or Jewish, but they are fungible. You really cannot distinguish them by color, but blacks are set aside by color. Thus, our caste is more dominant than our class, so that no matter what our intelligence may be, or our character may be, or our wealth may be, or our education may be, all blacks got the right of public accommodations on the same day because of our caste. All blacks got the right to play baseball on the same day. All blacks got the right to vote on the same day. And so our caste distinctions, along with our class distinctions, put a double yoke upon black people. And that makes us fundamentally different in our pilgrimage than other people. Sure, whites can talk about going from log cabin to the White House, or Jimmy Carter from peanut planter to the presidency. But somehow blacks with superior minds and character just cannot take that same route. So we must appreciate that we literally have to be superior to be equal. We're always facing a headwind of adversity. It's difficult to make it that way, but once you do, you're stronger and you're the better for it. On the other hand, there must be some sense of a spiritual foundation, that is, some sense of, of God-centeredness in one's life. That is to say that once you really know God, everything else is little. After all, God made man, he made sun, moon, and stars. And thus, to know God and to feel that one is in God's care, one can conquer all things, no mountain too high, no valley too low. It is with that sense of spiritual security, therefore, that one can say that no grave can hold my body down, or no jail cell can contain me, or no denial is too great. Every crucifixion can potentially become a resurrection. And that is that spiritual sign that allows one to go through the valleys and shadows of death and feel no evil. That is in great contrast, I might add, to picking one's brain in liquor, or putting dope in your veins rather than hope in your brains, or robbing and raping your neighbor, or engaging in some form of self-destruction whether it is suicide or homicide, as the case may be. Then there's the economic question. That is to say that we are down economically basically because of one-way trade. 2,200 soft drink franchises, zero black. We trade with soft drink franchises, they don't trade with us. Last year, Chrysler had $7.5 billion in sales. $3 billion in procurement or uh, trade, less than $20 million with blacks. That kind of trade record has economically bankrupted black America. The political side, of course, as I said earlier, is to fight for the extension of the right to vote and for the enforcement provisions to be enacted. And I would hope that you who are listening in television and looking in television land today would in fact do your best. We have an obligation to use our vote and our dollar scientifically. Let's take a call. For the people, you're on the air. Yes, I'd like to ask uh, Reverend Jackson, in reference to the billions of dollars that are spent uh, through the, the um, African-American church and the billion dollars that are unspent in the African-American church towards our economic development. How would you parallel the ties between the, our economic uh, deprivation and the fact that we have uh, a seemingly unnatural allegiance to the white business community as associated with our unnatural allegiance to the Caucasian image of Jesus? I use that as an example because I believe that in order to really totally be economically independent, we have to be as well spiritually and morally independent from uh, such uh, 
a limited uh, understanding. Uh, what's your response to that? Well, okay, to, be, thank you. To, to be sure, there must be uh, a spiritual liberation. There must be an allegiance to a sound theology. Uh, and we must know that, that Jesus was a, a dark-skinned Palestinian Jew with hair like lamb wool. And anyone who's been to the Middle East will know very well that Jesus could not very well have been blonde and blue-eyed unless he would have stood out as if he were an albino, as if there was something uh, wrong with his skin. And when one goes to the Eastern Orthodox Church, which is the oldest church, one sees the, the black Madonna as the highest object of worship. So there is something to be said about an attempt to, uh, to bleach Jesus and make Jesus, uh, to make God in the culture's own image rather than make the culture in the image of God. There's something to be said about that. Perhaps we can talk about it later. On the other hand, we must simply challenge our churches and schools and homes to use effectively our resources. We must turn to each other and not on each other. We must believe in each other. Uh, if we send our young children out of our churches, inspired to go to law school, we then must be able to let them handle our church business. Uh, most of our black schools are not retaining black lawyers or, or black CPAs. To be sure, we are doing, in that sense, less than our best. That is why the Push International Trade Bureau is in the process of organizing an economic common market. This is to say that we will be in to negotiate collectively as we confront these major corporations, begin to build our own banks and our own insurance companies, to use our own agencies to have belief and confidence and our own lawyers and professionals, and to begin to make a valid contribution to this economy. We really are intellectually capable of that, and to be sure we have enough money to be respected in this economy. Okay. For the people, you're on the air. For the people, you're on the air. For the people, you're on the air. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, Mr. Milliton, for having uh, Reverend Jackson on. I have two quick questions, and I'll hang up and I'll listen to you. Uh, Reverend Jackson, I heard you on the 6 o'clock news. Uh, talking about the voting and all having the right to vote and how many uh, people that are not registered to vote. Uh, well, I'm here in Clarendon County, which is a rather big county, but you've got a lot of black voters here that are registered but do not vote. I'd like to know, you know, uh, what you could do about that. I mean, if you could kind of come through, you know, all of Clarendon County is not Manning and the big cities. I mean, there are little places like Remini, Pinewood, and the rest of these little places where I live, you know, but I was just wondering if you could get somebody around to, you know, to check on these real country field people to tell them that the only right they have as a black person in South Carolina is the right to vote. Well, let, 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 let me suggest that the reason why I want you and others to come to Charleston, South Carolina, to our convention July 13th through the 17th, we're going to be conducting voter registration workshops and motivation workshops we have a list, the paper I have before me right now, of the 10 top counties where the voter registration is lowest, and those 10 counties were the actual numbers. I'm literally embarrassed when I looked at 69.91% of all the eligible black voters in Greenville County are unregistered. Seven out of 10, 20,000 voters unregistered. In terms of actual numbers, there are 36,000 blacks in Ridgeland County or Columbia eligible to vote who are not registered. And so now that we have the data, we've done the research, we're trying to get our ministers and our community workers and interested persons such as yourself to meet us in Charleston to register for the convention. It just costs $35 to register for the whole week. You may attend these workshops, become informed, become inspired, and leave there with a commitment to make a difference. Our goal is to have 100,000 more black voters on the books by the end of this year. That was my second question. Uh, I was going to ask how one could get, you know, to these conventions. I've, I've been involved in several of them. I notice uh, they are quite expensive. Now, I'm a high school graduate twice. I've gone to college and the University of Maine in Orono, and I haven't worked in two years. I can't even get a job working as a dishwasher. And that was my second question. How does one get to these kind of conventions? Thank you. Well, to be, to be sure, there are expense factors involved in a convention, so we've kept them as low as possible. Uh, some people are coming, for example, who are not staying in hotels. They're staying in their friends' homes. They're staying in their relatives' homes. Some others are driving down by day and driving back home at night, to be sure. When people come, they may participate in the workshops. 
Before the program is over tonight, we will share with you the number that you may call in Columbia to get more convention information and the number you may call in Charleston so that you will know where our headquarters church is and just basically where the convention will be. But nobody will be turned away because they cannot afford to participate in the convention. After all, your very presence is a form of wealth that we simply must use to develop the broader wealth of our community, what one might call the commonwealth. This agreement with Coca-Cola and some of these other companies that you've talked with, many people would say that it benefits basically middle-income people, business people, and that one of the criticisms of the civil rights movement is that its biggest beneficiaries have been middle-income and educated people. Do you think of that as a valid criticism? And what can be done <coughs> to broaden the range of, of people who can benefit in black prosperity? That's an invalid criticism. Mm -hmm. In 1965, when we went to Selma, Alabama to get the right to vote, there were 400 elected and appointed black officials in this nation. Today, there are almost 6,000. The economic range goes from the very bottom in many ways to the very top. From the very small, unincorporated towns to cities like Gary, Detroit, Los Angeles, and Newark, New Jersey. We've gone from three black congresspeople to 17. And the range of education and economic class varies there. That is an, an invalid accusation. One might say that people who are more prepared often have a greater ability to seize opportunity once the door is open. It's like if you're playing football and the line is open. Uh, it's open for whoever to run through to run through, but those who run the fastest tend to get through that faster, which says something about education. People who are educated tend to be able to run faster. They tend to have more mobility. They tend to be able to do more with what they got. That's one reason why more people need to get education. But the fact is, all people now have the right to use the bathroom downtown, have the right to use the hotel or motel of their choice. All of them now have the right to register and now have the right to vote. Our movement is incomplete because we got our civil rights. We don't have our civil rights. We got freedom, but we don't have equality. So many people have the right to take a vacation but can't afford it. They have the right to open housing but can't afford to get a house. They have the right to go to college but can't pay tuition. And so the unfinished business of our liberation movement is indeed economic emancipation. But to say that the civil rights movement somehow made a provision for a certain class of blacks that was not made for other blacks is invalid. After all, when people tend to get their education and strive hard, they can change their class even though they can't change their caste. For example, when I was born on the poor side of town, you know, with the slop jar in the house like other neighbors, and the bathroom or the outhouse in the backyard, and the tin top roof, uh, and the coal bin under the house, and you cut kindling with the wood stove, and you washed on the wash pot, and you had the clotheslines hanging out in the backyard, and you had the garden. Everybody in the house had, and everybody in the neighborhood had a skeleton key to everybody else's house. And I had to walk past the white schools to get to the black schools and use the books four years after white children had used them and not have backs on those books and couldn't bring those books home because six of us had to use that book. So the fact is that the fact that some of us, with the grace of God, are willing to go above and beyond the call of duty I can't say that the public accommodation bill didn't help me and my family. It did. Uh, the voting rights bill didn't help me and my family. It did. But thanks be to God, I was so determined because my parents inspired me to use what I had. I simply took the most of what was available. And so some choose the high road. Okay. And some choose the low road. But I think it is an unfair criticism to somehow suggest that black leadership is less concerned about poor people than they really ought to be. I don't think it's a fair criticism. Okay, let's take a call. For the people, you're on the air. I would like to ask Mr. Jackson, uh, what would be some of the ingredients in a recipe for the organization of a, a national black political party and <coughs> would be the, uh, the elements of its realization? Okay, thank you. <laughs> the key element is for more and more black people to realize that they cannot ride the freedom in Pharaoh's chariot. 
that the uh, Republican elephant is one of Pharaoh's animals. The Democratic donkey is one of Pharaoh's animals. And even though we may ride one chariot or the other for a given period of time, neither one of those parties have as their agenda the liberation of black people. We did not get public accommodations because the Democratic or the Republican Party. Black people initiated that drive. We did not get from the back of the bus to the front of the bus because a political party came to our rescue, either of them. Uh, not that we get the right to vote because of that. And so we must be clear on the fact that we must vote as an interest group. We may mature into a party. A party has to have a definite legal structure. It has to have a fundraising mechanism. It puts forth candidates. But we must at least operate as an interest group. Indeed, labor operates as an interest group. Management through its associations operate as an interest group. The Jewish community operates as an interest group. Black Americans who are in, uh, are in a caste system, who are in exile, living under occupation, can do no less than to organize as an interest group to put forth our interests first and the party interests second. The party must adjust to us, not us to the party. The party was made for us. We were not made for the party. So I think a sense of, of independence in the black political movement is in order and it's consistent with the way that the politics is played in America. Ethnic, economic, or worker interest groups. Political party has been tried. What is the, and you were involved, I think, in the initial um, political convention, I think, in Gary in that time. What is the status of that kind of movement today? Well, I think that the black political movement continues to mature and to grow. Uh, in some sense, the various political efforts in the past to start independent parties have been valid, but perhaps immature. You know, an idea's time has to come. Uh, the moment has to be right for certain ideas to be seized. I think, for example, that black Americans may have to put forth a valid candidacy in 1984. I am not convinced that just to have an anti-Reagan posture is necessarily good politics for blacks in 1984, or to have blind loyalty to blind democratic leadership. I think that we must have a vision that God has given us on what the nation ought to be about. We cannot follow a democratic party leadership that will literally celebrate uh, Mr. Begin breaking the law, killing 17,000 people with American weapons uh, and American money and American permissive will. We could not stand idly by while 17,000 are dead, doctors are locked away from hospitals, and 600,000 are left homeless. If an American president cannot live above the law, certainly an American client state cannot live above the law. I saw uh, in, uh, in, in Philadelphia last week a kind of uh, uh, I saw pe people, Democratic be convention. people being uh -huh. bankrolled into moral bankruptcy. They simply not have the moral authority. If one cannot speak with clarity and authority to the Israelis using a policy of genocide, wiping out Palestinian people indiscriminately, then one cannot challenge South Africa from going into Angola, or challenge the general from suppressing people in Poland, or Russia from coming into Afghanistan. We simply must have moral authority. And black Americans who have uh, withstood the heat of the day cannot be caught under the, under the limited moral degrees of just democratic leadership. On the other hand, we must have a formula for peace in the Middle East. And that's a critical area. After all, human beings are involved. We have an interest in Israeli security within the recognized boundaries. We as a nation have an interest in Israeli security. We also have an interest in affirming Palestinian humanity. Both are people, and both are God's people. And so the fight to reconcile them, to fight for, for Israeli security and Palestinian justice, represents forward thinking, courageous, progressive leadership. None of the Democratic candidates are willing to take that kind of position. But they've also been silent on Haitians in concentration camps. They're silent on America becoming the number one trading partner with South Africa. And so because of the kind of betrayal of silence, blacks must more and more use our 17 million eligible voters as a block 
in unity to speak so as to gain attention and to be heard. And we find that the issues that blacks raise are in the interest of everybody. When we fight for the government coming to the rescue of poor people who need food stamps because they don't have money, 55% of the food stamp recipients are white women. There are more whites on food stamps numerically than there are blacks. You should get food stamps based upon need, not based upon race. Poor people get the meals, but the rich get the millions. Last year, Win Dixie in Florida alone got a half billion dollars that they made from food stamps. One tenth of all food stamps went to the island of Puerto Rico. Their food stamps are used for income supplement. So to put a black face on food stamps is not good. Urban has a black face on it. There are more whites in urban America than there are blacks, and so it's unfair to use blacks as a scapegoat. Our welfare, there are four whites on welfare for everyone black. Aid to dependent children. There's not a body of able-bodied, lazy men. It's 92 percent, mostly women and children. And so somehow our leadership must project the kind of compassion for all people, whether they're white, black, or brown, Jew, Gentile, or Palestinian, we must have clear positions that are morally sound domestically and in the world community. I'm not going to stand back and just wait for leadership to come from one of these parties when, in fact, God has given us the witness and the intelligence to represent ourselves. Now, having said that the Democratic Party nor the Republican Party uh, is our answer, um, now we're not going to see Je uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson um, during the next presidential election <coughs> campaigning for a Democratic uh, president, are we? It's not necessarily so. Uh -huh. uh, it, it is not out of the question that I will not run myself. I've been approached you many times. You want to times. announce here? Well, I'm not ready to do that, but it is not out of the question. I simply mm -hmm. cannot stand by and remain despondent looking at what our options are. It almost comes down to me if, you know, if not me, who? Uh, if not now, when? If not here, where? I think we must make ourselves available to look at what our real live options are. I think black America could put real creative pressure on the political system that we now know it, a whole lot of pressure on the Democratic Party because it needs us. And we have not asserted ourselves in ways that really makes us felt, really makes our presence felt. I would think that politics being a game of, of inches and circumstances, we must finally make hard choices between live options. And so, even though I may uh, go politically, go on a political shopping spree uh, in November, or uh, two years from now, I may have chicken on my mind. But the only thing available may be some veal chop or some pork chop. And I may have to choose from the best of what's available. And that's life, and that's politics. But I have an obligation to at least write out my own menu and make it true to my own appetite. Allow me to pursue something you said a while ago. Um, are you seriously thinking about possibly running? Well, I have been seriously approached, and I am seriously thinking about it. I have not yet arrived at a conclusion, but I am not impressed with the Republican leadership in the White House. I was not inspired at all by the Democratic options I saw this past week in Philadelphia. And therefore, Mayor Richard Hatcher and others of us have been engaging in, in rather major discussions because I think that there's a, a broad base of, of blacks who felt locked out and women and Hispanics and young people. And the disconnected minorities just may very well be the majority, just may very well be the light and darkness that the nation needs. Last question along that line. Your goal, if you were to run, would be to do what? To win or possibly what? You know, I have um, never run for political office before because I have remained true to the prophetic tradition. And so I have not yet made that determination yet. But the goal would be to win. And it would be to mold the, the discordant elements that are now uh, feeling leaderless into an orchestrated unit so that we can have enough of power to make a difference, whether it is on a South African policy or a Middle Eastern policy or an anti-nuclear policy or a domestic policy of reindustrialization. 
so as to make corporate America more accountable to America. Somehow, when you look at government and ghetto, government and ghetto, ghetto and Democrats, ghetto and Republican, corporate America owns the government and the ghetto. Any plan that does not involve a reindustrialization scheme and an obligation by corporate America is inadequate. It is economically insufficient. And so I am rather convinced that, uh, that winning is possible. But I know that making an impression that would make a difference is even likely, I mean, like very likely. Okay, let's take a call. For the people, you're on the air. Uh, Reverend Jackson, um, in reference to the statement that you indicated earlier where you'd like to register an additional 100,000 voters in South Carolina, could you elaborate on what difference that would make as far as economic conditions in South Carolina? I'll hang up and listen to you. Thank you. Well, the, the 100,000 additional black voters have absolutely determined the attitude and behavior of state officials of people who have to run statewide toward black people. I mean, with an additional 100,000 black voters, the choice of governors, no matter what party they represent, would be much more humane toward black people because they cannot afford to be otherwise. No group could afford to politically isolate us. You absolutely would not have the kind of Strom Thurmond polarization. No senator could afford to run on, on veiled threats toward black people or use us as a scapegoat or use us as a stepping stone. An additional 100,000 black voters would get us one or two blacks in the U.S. Congress. It would get blacks in the state Senate. And it would, it would determine in a greater measure legislation in the House and in the Senate. Plus, it would make way for a new coalition between blacks and progressive whites that could liberate this whole state. So long as whites and blacks are in a kind of unspoken civil war looking at each other, we cannot look at our real human potential as a group of people in the state. After all, we have the Atlantic Ocean as a part of the landscape of our state. There's no reason why South Carolina cannot be a very wealthy state. We have natural resources. We have human resources. We have a, uh, uh, we have a, uh, uh, an ocean port uh, in Charleston. And so if, in fact, black Americans in this state add an additional 100,000 voters, it will, in, it will affect the politics of this state into the next century. Okay, let's take some calls. All lines are lit. For the people, you're on the air. Yes, uh, I'm a concerned citizen. Of, uh, about several years ago, concerned black citizen was uh, trying to uh, find out why this uh, flag was still flying over the state capitol. I was just wondering, uh, I hadn't heard anything more about it, and just, I mean, for a black person to uh, succeed in his morale and his esteem through trying to do right for his fellow man and with uh, Reverend Jackson, Jackson just trying to uh, do for everybody overall, it would be kind of hard to do that with a flag flying over the uh, state capitol like that. I was just wondering what, uh, why ha hasn't anything been done about that yet. Okay, I thank think you. That, there have been many attempts by black state legislators to get the Confederate flag down. But I suggest to you that we're going to have to raise our people up and then pull the flag down. But in the real sense, the more people we have on the books, and therefore the more folks we have in the legislature on the House and Senate side, the more likely we are to be able to pull that flag down and other forms of, of humiliation. So I would recommend that the energy that we spend looking at the White House, the State House, and the Courthouse for answers and help. Answers really come from your house and my house and the house of prayer. And when we use what we got, God will give us the increase. And we have enough power collectively to make our enemies leave us alone. Okay, let's take a call. For the people, you're on the air. For the people, you're on the air. Yes, uh, Mr. Jackson, earlier you said that uh, corporate America refuse to trade with black people, although, although the black people are, are trading with corporate America. You know, I've always understood trade to be an exchange be between two different parties, and, and so that any time that there's any trade that both are involved, what it seems to me you're calling on is a boycott to, to punish 
these corporations. I'd like you to respond to that and, and also to, to comment on whether or not this will create any further animosity uh, that will continue, you know, this. Okay, you want to hold? Yes. You okay, know, uh, uh, there are two parties. I mean, that is the producer, uh, the corporate company, and blacks are the consumers. And so there are two parties. Without the consumer, the producer cannot stay in business. Without the producer, the consumer cannot be served. And so they need each other. There's the basis for a two-way relationship. Except historically there's been a, a one-way relationship. We consume and become the company's margin of profit. Historically we've worked and been the company's cheap labor base. And yet when it comes to trade, they will not retain our lawyers or our CPAs or use our products, our goods, our services, or loan us money in venture capital arrangements and so it's one-way trade. The result is the black community becomes what? A huge trade deficit with a talent surplus. You can't go to Japan and just take business. You must share ownership. You can't go to Mexico and just take business. You must share ownership or Nigeria. That must be a, a development formula. And a formula of one-way trade is a colonial formula. It is not a uh, two-way trade. When, when uh, uh, we deal with Japan, we uh, expect them to trade with us because we trade with them. It's called reciprocal trade. Now, if black America is, is more than the margin of profit of a given company, it's not too much for us to expect of them to trade with us while we trade with them. Indeed, we have some moral obligation, some moral imperative uh, to, to cooperate with the good and to not cooperate with the evil. And I suggest people who want it one way are essentially evil. And we have no moral obligation to embrace, to embrace the evil. How do you feel about that, sir? Well, I, I agree basically with, with a lot of the things you're saying. What my fear would be that, that through this group action or, or what I would call a boycott or you know, uh, uh, deciding for train, uh, the, the trade on one side, that we might create more animosity that, that will further uh, that will further influence the corporations, corporate America, whatever, to uh, to further isolate the black people. That's, okay, that's thank you. About. A short comment on they, that. They, they are not able to further isolate us because our buying power is too great and too significant for them to further isolate us. Just as politicians through gerrymandering and annexation and at large run from our vote. The businesses run to our dollar. To vote, you've got to be 18, you got to register, and you got to choose a candidate. But to spend that dollar, you don't have to do any of that. And so in a real sense, we simply must change this basic pattern. Now, it was said that if blacks really insist on playing baseball in 1947, that we'd make a lot of people angry. We did. But so what? I mean, if, if anger was the only way that they could express a reaction to justice, then they simply had to mature and learn to control their emotions. It was said if blacks ever really fought for public accommodation, that our fighting for the right to use the bathroom downtown, our fighting for the right to vote, it would really upset people. Well, it did, but they had to adjust because they had to adjust to the law. In the real sense, it said if blacks ever became mayors of cities and congressmen, something would happen. Nothing would really happen except the nation became better for it. And so in a real sense, uh, for corporate America to expand and black America to develop is in everybody's interest. And we may not change their attitude, but we're concerned to change their behavior. And we have no intention of eternally remaining in a one-way relationship. As you know, the black Timmy's unemployment rate is about 50 percent. What does Operation Push uh, propose to do about that. There is no way to reduce massive unemployment without government assistance. The government has some real obligation. First of all, it's not just black unemployment. There's an economic depression across the board. It's hitting blacks disproportionately because we're disproportionately in the public economy because we're locked out of the private economy. In Gary, unemployment is 88 percent. 88 percent. Some other cities it is up to 50 percent. Far lower than the depression or 50 years ago. The government, pro the government has not reduced the budget under the Reagan administration. It has simply shifted the budget and expanded it. 
the, the federal deficit is greater now than it has ever been before. The budget's bigger now than ever before. There's even more money to train young people than ever before, except the, the money that was going into CETA to train young men how to heal is now going into the Pentagon training young men how to kill. There has been a shift in the money and a shift in values, and the government has some real obligation to put much more focus on education, on training and employment of our young people, and form a partnership with corporate America so as to make it work. Speaking of killing, the Brookings Institute, as you know, recently released a study which showed that 20 percent, Afro-Americans made up 20 percent of the military personnel. Uh, how do you feel about that situation? To be sure, blacks uh, in the main are, are locked out of public schools. You in Chicago four years ago, 49,000 freshmen entered a school system 65 percent black. This past June, only 19,000 graduated. Where are those 30,000? They're unemployed, they're unskilled, they're in jail, they have low-skilled jobs, or they're in the military. And so, in some sense, we either are going to train our children in school or we're going to train them in jail or train them in the Army. Many young blacks go to the military just to have a job and get a chance to travel someplace because of our reduced economic options in the domestic economy. Okay. How do you feel about the fact that if a war were to come about, the black American soldier would be paying a disproportionate uh, amount of cost, if you We've will? We've done that in every major war. So blacks, you're saying it's black, okay now blacks, or what? Blacks died disproportionately uh, in the Civil War. We fought to free ourselves. We fought to enslave ourselves. Blacks fought disproportionately in, in the Vietnam War. And so it is interesting to me, not only have we died more than our share of deaths, but no black man, no black, not one single black has ever been convicted of treason. There's a gross underestimation of black intelligence, black loyalty, black patriotism, and black productivity to this country. I would hope that no young man, black or white, would get trapped in the Falkland Islands in some folly, or get trapped in the Middle East in some gen genocide policy, or get trapped in South Africa fighting against moral interests. I would hope really that we, we, that we would study war no more and beat our swords in the plowshares. The reason why this anti-nuclear activity is so important because in this instance, those who are not enlisted as soldiers, the non-military people, will die from nuclear fallout. So everybody really is in the war, and therefore everybody must march to stop the nuclear proliferation. Okay, let's take a call. For the people, you're on the air. Thank you very much. I'd like to say I really enjoyed uh, what Reverend Jesse Jackson been saying. I'm a... Thank you very much. We have less than three minutes. Okay, I'm a white male, middle uh, 30s, and uh, I was wondering, uh, I was wanting to say that I hope that sometime in the future that I'd be able to, to vote for this man, and if he was ever in some debates with some of the leading presidential candidates, I believe that uh, the Americans would we'd have a clear choice of some good answers to solve the problems we have. And I was wondering if he would answer, uh, if, would, if he was our president, would, would we have a bigger government than what we have to be able to solve our problems? That's the only thing that I was a little worried about in, uh, in what he was saying as far as, like, producing jobs for people, or, or would that be an answer to reduce our government? Now, I would be concerned Ian, thank you. Thank of, you. of an effective government, whether it's big or small. For example, if you were uh, going to court and your life was in jeopardy, you wouldn't demand that your lawyer conduct a short trial. You would demand that he conduct an effective trial. Hopefully short, but it may be long, but you want to get free. Or if you were going to surgery, you wouldn't demand that your doctor give you short surgery. You demand he give you sufficient surgery because you want to get well. If government plays the role of the balancing wheel between labor and management, then government can help labor and can help management and can keep a moderate size. But if the corporate America collapses because the corporations uh, have inferior management because when they make their money, they, they take it out of the economy and buy slave labor to undercut American labor, if the corporations replace 
uh, machines, replace people with machines, the corporate sector drops down on its responsibility. It forces the government to offset the corporate collapse. And that's how you get an imbalance. Now what we have in the Reagan situation is that government has jumped in the bed with corporate America against workers and poor people. And thus we have an economic depression for some and unprecedented wealth for others. We've got a minute. I know you want to touch on the convention again. I do, but what I really was trying to get, and I mm -hmm. hope that you will play it back next week, mm -hmm. is, the, is the telephone number here in, in Columbia. I do not have that just now. Okay. One may call our office here, as well as in Charleston. So if you want further information, I hope that they would call the station uh, to get information about our office here. Uh, the convention dates are July 13th through the 17th. All people are welcome to attend. Uh, Black America and Economic Common Market is our theme. For $35 for a week, one may register. If you are interested, black or white, young or old, in joining this drive, to register an additional 100,000 blacks to vote. In this state, between now and the end of this year, I want you to call the station to get involved with Operation Push and, in fact, come to that convention and make this an historic occasion. Five-second answer. Does Reverend Jesse Jackson ever get tired? Yes, I get, in I get tired, but I also get revived because I have learned to do much with a little. Reverend Jackson, thank you for coming home to South Carolina. All right, <laughs> Alabama. That's our program. Thanks for joining us.